Hello everybody and this is our first issue of Talking Porkies. This is a little programme we're going to do based on um, people who have record collections that remember their Porky Prime Cuts records specifically. Um, I'll present what a Porky Prime Cut is here. Um, there was an etching that was put on by a record master um, who always put his name Porky in there. I hope you can see on that. There is it coming up and glisten on it. But you should be able to make that out there. Porky Prime Cut. Um, I have with me here Ben Norris, who is a musician, a comedian, and a record collector. Of, and I would like to bring in Ben. Hi, Ben. How are you doing? Hi, Paul. Good to see you, mate. Interesting premise, this. Yeah. I, li I like the idea. Well, what I've done is I've asked Ben to go through his record collection and pull out some of his favourite porcupine cuts. Um, if ben, if you'd like to explain that process to us and sort of clarify on it. Well, I... I, I really, uh, I relished the idea because I, for a start, I thought I'd have hundreds of these. And because um, I just, like you, I remember seeing Porky's Prime Cuts on the the inside section of the of so many of my records, the inside section, wh whatever you call that bit. Run out what group. do you call that? Run the run out groove. Yeah, I, 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 thought I, I thought I'd seen it thousands of times, but I, I obviously didn't, but it stuck in my mind. And I went through a large collection of singles and found uh, six, six that were actually Porky's Prime Cuts. And I thought there'd be so many more, but um, it's interesting the... the LPs. Uh, yeah, well, I haven't actually had a chance to look through the LPs. They're, they're, they're stored somewhere else, but the singles were more easily accessible. Uh, but I'll, I'll do that at a later date and get back to you about the LPs. But um, the whole process was great. It was just really nice. Because I had to really look at a lot of these, you know, you had to get most of the singles out of the sleeves to look at the, well, you know, it was the only way of checking. And just reminded you of so many, so many great days, so many bits of your life that have gone forever. That's what I find lovely about the process. Um, I did a night previously um, with DJs playing records uh, that were all porcupine cuts. And they loved the fact that they were unearthing things that they hadn't listened to for years. And it's quite evocative of a lot of memories and a lot of sort of, yeah, your yeah, memories and sort of nostalgia and oh my, yeah. that day and all the rest of it. So if you wouldn't mind, Ben, I want to just introduce on your first single out of your selection. Okay. So the first one is, um, it's, it's Reckless Eric. Ah. Um, I think this was on, this was on Stiff Records. Um, it's the, the, the track is Whole Wide World. A wonderful. And it's a really great tune. You know it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic song, yeah. Isn't it fabulous? And um, yeah, and that's and it's very it's very much uh, a Porky's prime cut. And of course, he he would often write other stuff, wouldn't he? Not just his name, but other little um, cryptic things. So this one says, uh, <laughs> "Semaphorely yours, Eric." Um, and I don't know if that's Porky offering himself to Eric, or that's Eric asked him to put that on there, I don't know. But it does say a Porky Prime Cut. Uh, I don't know if, it, well, you could, probably can't. It's very difficult to show, isn't it? Yeah, but, it can catch but, them, so it is difficult to show. I, I there it is. LP out on a similar note about other etchings. This year's model, which are obviously a fantastic record. Uh, and the other, they've got the Porky Prime Cut written, but on the other side, it's right, it writes ring, Four three four three three two three two. Ask for Moira for your special prize. And you can <laughs> That's lovely. Receiver, um, well, of course, uh, um, uh, aficionados will know there's a big connection uh, between Elvis Costello and um, Eric Reckless Eric because they all went on the first big stiff tour That's together. Right. With um, who else was on that? It is management, wasn't it? Uh, the other people on that tour were, um, um, was it Brinsley Schwartz? Was it? The, 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 um, I think that Mitch tour had, the, the, there was two tours, wasn't there? So I could get things mixed up. There ah. was the only attractions. There was Reckless Eric. There was Larry, oh God, Larry Wallace. Who You've got me there, I don't know him. Um, I think Blockheads. Right. Been there. Yeah. And Lydia Lovich, 
that be? Uh, you you might be conflating Lena Lovitch and Lydia Lunch. Lydia Lunch was American though, wasn't she? I don't think. Yeah. She so so it's Lena Lovitch. Lena Lovitch. That's it. Yeah. Yes. Let's say that's come. Yeah. I just watched a stiff that stiff tour documentary recently. I think they did one on a train. They all travelled the country. Yes. By. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes, it just brings up memories and things, doesn't it? It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, Great days. And what age were you when you bought that Reckless Eric record? Well, uh, I didn't buy it when it came out because I was I was only probably about, um, well, what year did it come out? Let's see if it says on here. I think this came out about 78. What do you think? About 78? Possibly 79, but probably 78. It should say on the record, shouldn't it? Um, 77. It's yeah. 77. Yeah. So I was 10. I was only 10. Uh, so this is the sort of record my older brother would have bought at the time. So a lot of my punk uh, stuff I kind of actually got hold of and many years later. Yeah, I so I, this this has got a little thing on saying three pounds. So I probably bought that, you know, in, in the mid 80s. Um, but I, yeah, I sort of went back and tracked down lots of stuff that I knew that instinctively was was something I would have been into had I been old enough. Um, but I did actually, I started buying records really young. I was the youngest of four in my family, but I bought records from about the age of six. So going through my singles, I found Tiger Feet by Mud. And I know that I bought that when it came out and that's 1973. So I was one of the, I was six. I mean, that's ridiculous to be buying records at six, um, but I did. But so, but I wasn't buying the punk stuff. I think I was a bit frightened uh, about it uh, at 10, but by the time I was 13, 14, I was really into it and I'd got into all the two-tone and the Scar Revival stuff and I think I went through that and back into punk and then embraced the whole the whole thing. Do you remember buying the Reckless Eric single? I remember buying it but as, a, but it, as I say it would, it would, oh, would be many years later really would, and I was excited to find to find such a such a it's quite a, probably quite a rare single that I don't know how many of those yeah, yeah. There, there won't be millions of those out there will there? I doubt, I doubt it. <laughs> It's not up there with Thriller, is it? <laughs> it's a great tune, though. The well, whole wide world. It's just a classic little three chord, you know, heartfelt little punk number. And do you remember where you were living at the time when you bought that? I think I was living in Guildford. Yeah. I, I lived in Guildford uh, for quite a while, you know, to Guildford down the A3. Because uh, I grew up in Farnborough, Hampshire, and... Um, when I moved out of my house with my first girlfriend, we moved into a little flat in Guildford and I had a job running a, a quick print, you know, a, a quick print sort of business. So people coming with photocopying and making, uh, getting business card printed up and stuff. And that's probably when I first uh, started collecting older records. Up until then, I would have been buying contemporary, you know, and maybe, maybe I've just started buying CDs. Uh, it's probably the beginning of CDs. Um, but I went back into buying buying singles, especially old Trojan stuff. I always got very excited when I saw Trojan records for sale. Did you shop in Guildford for buying things? Um, let's see if I can... There, there, yes, there was, but can I remember what it was? That was so long ago. Um, there was a couple of... There was certainly a couple of collectible record shops in Guildford at the time, and I can't... I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't recall, but yeah... I had spare time and spare money in those days for that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I was actually, when CDs came out and that was a new thing, it's a great time to collect vinyl because vinyl just was dark cheap and really. Everyone expensive. was getting rid of it, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah, it was wonderful. It's, that was uh, like crazy. Literally 20 pence, 25 pence to buy seven inch singles and yeah. sort of stalls, you know. People were dumping their whole collections, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah, you could just read Big Sisters, Brothers, all that stuff. Just take, well, I don't know if I'd consent when I read their stuff, but, um, <laughs> but I certainly went to good use of it. Yeah, you've not played that, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I definitely nicked several albums off my older brother just, just because I thought he hasn't played that for a while, I'll just borrow it. And then eventually he left home and I just had them. And now he lives in New Zealand, so I think they're mine forever. Yeah, you've got them now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what's number two in our list? Well, funny enough, this this connects very 
very well to the Big Brother conversation because the band that he really got me into was the Stranglers. He had loads of most of their albums. Is that why you moved to Guildford? Uh, that, that is completely coincidental, but obviously there's a huge Guildford connection with the Stranglers. They basically started there, didn't they? I think they were and, uh, Guildford Stranglers. They were, that's right. They, they were called the Guildford Stranglers. And uh, Jet Black used to run a, an ice cream business and they used to rehearse in one of his buildings. And I think they even used to go to gigs in an ice cream van, from what I understand. <laughs> Um, but this is my this is my next um, this is my next Porky Prime cut, and it's, um, it's the Stranglers' Five Minutes, uh, which is a fantastic um, record. It's a it's a tale of um, well, it's it's JJ Burnell sings on this one, I believe, and it's it's, it's one of his uh, sort of violent violence fantasies where he. Um, well, they, they kill his cat and rape his wife, as he says in the in the song, and then it's all about him um, uh, fantasizing about uh, violent retribution on these these violent thugs that have uh, done such horrible things to him. But it's a great it's a great tune, and it's a Porky Prime cut as well. It's but yeah, strange. Rocket to the Moon, I think, is the B side to that, is it? Uh, correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Rocket to the Moon. Yeah, it's wonderful. Very, I, ended up, um, I ended up many years later, I ended up meeting and becoming kind of friendly with Hugh Cornwall. Oh, wow. Long after he left the band, a sort of mutual friend introduced us and I, uh, and I was trying not to be too much of a fanboy, but I had to um, admit to him that I was a huge, you know, I was a huge fan. And he asked me which was my favourite album and it felt like a bit of a test. And I said, well, my favourite Stranglers album is... Um, uh, the Gospel According to the Men in Black, which was probably their least commercially successful album and one of their weirdest, because I think they they made it while they were very uh, heroin uh, heavy. And of course they were starting to become obsessed with the idea of alien invasion, i.e. the Men in Black. And he um, shook me by the hand and, and sort of lit up and said, well, that's my favorite album. And it was, it was a fantastic moment. Cause it that's felt a like- fan, fan, A fan's fan's album, isn't a it? A fan's fan's album, exactly, yeah. And it, and it is, a, I still love it to this day, but that was a good moment. Uh, I even ended up staying at his house one time because I was uh, being a stand-up comic, I'm traveling around all the time. And he said, oh, if you're ever near um, a Bath, uh, come and stay because he, he's got a house somewhere out that way and I happened to have a gig coming up near Bath and I said I'm going to be there on you know Saturday the, the whatever and he said come and come and stay oh wonderful and I stayed at his, stayed at his house it was amazing uh, mind-blowing because for him it was just oh it's just this young fellow who's young I mean I'm, I was probably in my 40s but uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's yeah but um but for me you know I was in his spare room and seeing copies of Strangled magazine and thinking I'm absolutely in my element here, but... Um, is he still very much... Because it was quite an acrimonious split with him and the Stranglers, wasn't it? The, the, yeah. The, yeah, so well, he told me he got sick of... Orientated. He got sick of being attacked by JJ at the end of gigs, you know. Okay. So, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how physical he was, but it sounds like he was just quite... You know, they had a lot of fallouts. And Hugh I just had enough of it. You're almost dead, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think he's been begged so many times to come back and reform the band, you know, to get back into the band. Large sums of money have been offered and all sorts, but I don't think it's ever going to happen. Yeah. But I've seen the Stranglers with, um, you know, with uh, what's his name, the the Geordie guy that that's been singing. Warren, Warren something. I can't remember. Um, he's excellent. Anyway, I mean, it, you know, if you can't have you. He is so good. I mean, he really sounds like you. He plays as good as you ever played. And, and or as, a, as a full package, if you can get over the uh, prejudice a lot of Stranglers fans have of it not being Hugh, it's, it's, you're still seeing most of the Stranglers and somebody who's, who's really nailed the, um, the songs. And, and uh, I've seen them several times with that lineup, and it's, it, they're still a brilliant live band. I mean, I think after the Rolling Stones, maybe status quo are there too. Stranglers are probably the longest consecutively running band. Right, yeah. I mean, they must, they must love it because you, I can't believe they need to gig as much as they do just to pay the bills, but they're always touring. So yeah. I, think they just, I think they just love it. 
I think Jet, uh, Jet Black is now quite elderly. So he, uh, last time I saw them, the, I think the, his um, drum tech has taken over as the drummer and Jet comes on for a couple of tunes and then they sort of wheel him off and then the drum tech comes back on. And the drum tech, I have to say, is also an excellent drummer, but, yeah. um, but it's quite sweet. Yeah, Jet, uh, Jet Black still wants to play, but he hasn't got the stamina to play. Is he not playing well. with oxygen supplied to him? <laughs> uh, I'd love to see that. He wasn't doing it the night I saw him. But okay, that, okay. Uh, that would suit him. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So that's a perfect sort of um, Guildford connection as well as Big Brother connection there with Stranglers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And do you um, remember where you bought that? Uh, this, I think I, I think I bought this. This is not, this is another secondhand shop purchase because by the time I bought this, I had all you know, I had everything the Stranglers had ever, ever produced, probably on vinyl and on CD, and okay. probably quite a few cassettes as well. In fact, uh, the Gospel According to Men in Black, I only owned on cassette, and I used to keep it in my old Renault 5, and I just remember, pl I used to play it back to back, you know, it finish and I'd turn the cassette over and play it again, all the time while I was driving. So that became like my first big driving album. Um, <clears throat> only, uh, I think, yes, the Renault 5 was my sister's car, and then handed down to me. And it always had a horrible smell. I can't remember what they coming out of the engine. It was really weird. And I was in a band with my cousin and we used to use it for uh, gigging, uh, putting my bass amp and my bass in the back and off we'd go to these gigs. I drove it into a ditch once because I was turning, my bass uh, fell down in the back seat and I turned around to try and move it to a more comfortable position and uh, drove into a ditch. <laughs> so when I turned back around, we were in a ditch with all of our equipment around our ears. Um, yeah, great days, great days. Lots of um, lots of good minutes. Stranglers. I, I think I've probably listened to them for five or ten times more than any other artist I've ever listened to, and some of them too much. You know, I mean, I just was obsessed by the Stranglers to, to the point where I knew every moment of every tune. You know what I mean? I've never had that thing of wearing a record out. I always hear, hear people saying that. I've never had a record wear out on me, but people always come that line. Have you ever had that? Um, well, I think I probably would have done if I hadn't moved on to cassettes and then on to CDs. So those albums, those Stranglers albums, I probably own in all three formats. If I'd only ever owned them on vinyl, they would have probably worn out by now. But I, I, uh, I'm I always I'm find that weird when people say it. You know, I'm like, kind of, are you that much a fan of you just need to invest in a new needle? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> it yeah. happened to me. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine perhaps uh, hip hop DJs probably wear out a few records, don't they? With the yeah. scratching. I can imagine that would take its toll quite quickly. Yeah. So I think we should move on to number three. Number three was a shock to me because I it's the only oh no, I own two records by this band. And I went to see this band, I think it was at Kingston Poly. They used to do a lot of gigs. Uh, there at Kingston University or Kingston Polytechnic and they were meant to be I think for students only but they didn't seem to check so we always used to go to gigs there and a friend of mine told me about this band called Buddy Curtis and the Grasshoppers this was late 80s and uh, in 1989 actually this sorry 85 this came out in 85 so this is a, a record called Shuby Baby this must be incredibly rare there's yeah, a cartoon in of the band. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. Have you ever heard of this band? No, not at all, no. So they were like a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine piece, uh, very, very uh, authentic looking kind of rock and roll soul band, but they did their own material. I think they did a few covers, but they did their own stuff, but they all wore really sharp suits. They all had the quiffs. They had a, you know, double bass player and, trump you know, trumpet and saxophone and, um, they, I mean, they forgot they were, how big the kind of rockabilly and rock and roll scene was in the mid fifth mid, mid eighties. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Loads and by that time, I I was sort of hanging around with a load of skateboarders, and a lot of them had an interest in that kind of retro fashion. And so everyone seemed to have a quiff and a Hawaii shirt and sort of pointy brothel. Do you know what I mean? There was a lot of that yeah. going on, <clears throat> uh, and a lot of people who were sort of you know would be punks but also would come to a gig like this um 
And they, the great thing about this band is that um, most members of the band were called something Dexter. So um, there's Duke Dexter and Frankie Dexter and Spook Dexter and Floyd Dexter. And um, several of them sang as well. And they had really good voices. Um, so this, I, I don't know how many copies of that single exist out there in the world. I shouldn't think many because they weren't a hugely a famous band by any means. This got one of those most do-it-yourself sort of uh, record labels. Gyrate Records, look at that. Wonderful. And the, I think we picked up the Porky so, Cup there as well. Did you see the Porky Cup? I think we did, yeah. Sometimes it catches the light just perfect. Yeah, see, see it, it? Right there, yeah. There you go. So that one, I wasn't expecting to be a porcupine cup, but there it was. So he got his hands on some small, in that must have been quite a small independent label. And I bet you've and, bought um, a lot of that record for years. I haven't even thought of it. You're right. I, hadn't, I literally hadn't thought of it until, until I got it out of the record collection the other day for, for 30 years, probably. Um, I haven't even played it. I should play it again. It's, uh, I remember liking it. But it's just sort of very authentic rock, rockabilly, rock and roll sort of sound. Um, I know one of these guys, I think it was the bass player, he used to work behind the bar at the Bedford in Ballam, which of course is also a famous music and comedy venue, uh, a, a night called the, the Ballam Banana. And I used to meet him in there and I remember telling him, oh, I saw your band back in the day. And he was, he was uh, very chuffed that I, that I remembered his band. So that's that one. Wonderful. Um, the next one, uh, is probably the, I was shocked at how bad the condition of this record was. I don't know if you can see the, um, the mess on that Ooh. single. I don't know what that is. Could, could be vomit, could be uh, animal. It looks like cleanable. Uh, it's probably cleanable because, and it should be because this is a classic. Day Trip to Banger, Fiddler's oh, Dram. Do you remember that, Paul? I do, yes. So that was a hit in uh, 19... So what year would you have said that was? See, I think I actually... No, I think this is a 1977 record. Well, that's what I thought. But actually, it was brought out in 1979. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, the only explanation, I guess, could be if this was re-released or something. So, but, but I, 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 I... I could well be wrong with that. It, was, it wasn't of its time, I remember that, even, even as a young kid. Well, it was a weird hit, wasn't it? It was a big, big It used to appear in, like, the two Ronnie's shows, and just, you know, they were kind of... They got mass exposure, but not on the normal routes, you know? They were very much... It, yeah, just it wasn't... It wasn't top of the pops kind of stuff, if you know what I mean, even though they did go on there. So Porky, he, he obviously signed it, Porky's Prime Cut, but he also scraped in there... Yes, we had a lovely time. Is a, is a record I believe he's, the, um, to use the pun. He's been quite cutting in a few records. As if I've, I don't have it, but I've seen a photo where he just wrote, "I don't like this." Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I bought this again, probably much later on, to play it. Um, I used to, my cousin and I, who were in the band together, Jamie. Uh, we also we used to hang around with a load of anarcho punks in the Farnham area back in the uh, uh, mid '80s, and we used to run a we used to DJ at a thing called the Black Spot in a little pub in a place called Recklesham, because a friend of ours' dad owned the pub, and he let it had one of those old pubs with two bars, and on Sundays they didn't get enough business, so he handed one bar over to. Uh, the Farnham anarcho punks, and we were allowed to do whatever we wanted in there. And my cousin and I used to DJ, so we would play, you know, Crass and Killing Joke and stuff like that, the cult. And um, but also we would chuck in some funny, you know, retro pop, and it, we, and try and make everyone have a, a laugh. And Day Trip to Banger would have been one of the ones that I would have, I'd have dropped that tune uh, to all these festivals and arco punks with their dogs on bits of string and and we'd have all jumped around drinking cider and snake bite and uh and living the life <laughs> and, that, and actually that probably explains why it's got something that looks like sick on it that would make sense really. yeah <laughs> i like that, that that song symbolized the anarcho punk scene of fun <laughs> uh, absolutely well you've got to have a break from uh 
Funnily, yeah. when I was about 13, I used to write to a guy from a band, I think they were from there, called Mega City Four. Yes, they were from Farnborough. That's right, yeah. Wiz was the guy I used to write to. I actually managed to arrange a gig. I was only about 14, 13, 14. But I used to write to John Peel and write down to him, and he would write back, you know, and right. I show up. In sadly, I, I, I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure he's sadly no longer with us. I think that's correct, yeah. I don't, I don't know the story behind it, but yeah, I think, I think you're right there, yeah. Well, there was another Farnborough uh, band called Black Easter, who were a punk band who, who released a few singles. You know what it was like back then. And for, for us, that made them, they were like stars. And my sister used to go out with um, the singer from Black Easter. And uh, so that was our claim to fame that we hung around with them for a bit back in those days. And they had a quite a big following around Farnborough, this Farnborough punk scene. There was all these little mini punks. There was the Woking lot. My sister ended up marrying uh, a guy called uh, Lank, well, that was his punk nickname because he was about seven foot tall and then another two foot of Mohican on top of that. She's still with him. He doesn't look like that anymore. But uh, so we used to hang out. Sometimes the Farnham punks would migrate over to Woking and there was a, a venue called the Old Schoolhouse and we used to go and see live bands and stuff there. And uh, yeah, it was good. Great days. So dangerous days. There always seemed to be fights and things to be frightened of and police turning up at things and gigs in squats and... Uh, yeah, lots of lots of uh, action. That squat scene must have been particularly fun. Yeah, well, they never lasted because you know, people weren't very good at securing uh, those places. And you know, we I had various friends that some were genuinely homeless and needed to squat, and others were quite middle class and <laughs> just wanted a, somewhere to be for the weekend before they went back to mummy. Uh, so there was a bit of a combination of those two. But yeah, we had some. What we once squatted an outdoor swimming pool in Farnham, oh, and wow. put on a two, we put on a two-day music festival, the Brightwell Swimming Pool uh, Festival, and uh, we had about eight bands on. It was great. Uh, a load of terrifying skinheads turned up from Aldershot, and we thought they were going to beat us all up, but they just sort of sat in one corner and sniffed glue, and <laughs> let's get on with it. <laughs> great days. Great days. And what's our next choice? Well, this is a very, this is a, this, well, I wonder if we should, no, I'll come back, I'll do this one next. So I had really fond memories of this single because this I bought, I definitely bought this one when it came out and this was pre uh, my involvement with punk, although punk was happening, but I was uh, doing my own thing. Um, this came out, I think in 1981 by the looks of things. And I'll give you a clue, see if you can guess what this is. I think this might've been one of the first or maybe only instrumentals of the 80s era that got into the top 10. Do you think you could uh, work out what that might be? Oh, I was going to... Oh, I forgot what the, the name is. Um, there's obviously a lot of the American kind of electro -y things that kind of happened out, Paul Hardcastle and things like that, but 81, but, I can't think what you're thinking of. No. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a clue. I'll show you the sleeve. That's a joke. It's just a white sleeve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no help. I was going to jump. Um, <laughs> so it was on Rough Trade, and also it looks like a combination between Rough Trade and Y Records. The letter Y. I don't know if that Wait, helps. Should it be that thing? Oh God, I forgot what it's called now. Um, something to do with a rat. Um, oh, it sounds a bit like the Jams. Precious. Is that right? It's, it's not. No. <laughs> it's, not, it's not. It's called Papa's Got a Brand New Pig Bag. That's, I, mean, that's, I mean, pig bag, not rat. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I realise that... Fantastic now, record. It's an amazing, an amazing tune. It still sounds incredible. Still, you know, it's... How, how old is that? 35 years old and it still sounds brilliant. You can put that on in any nightclub and I think... The kids would go crazy. Yeah, the roof would go off with that, absolutely, yeah. It's a really good tune. a little bit like Precious from the Jam. I was close. Oh, yeah, I said, yes, actually, yeah, there's the horns and the, and the drums. Yeah. I'm sure well, the was Jam a... took from that. I'm sure the Maybe. Jam. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I get a Paul, Paul Weller's got, you know, he's, he's a musical magpie at times, isn't he? And, not, and I don't mean that in any 
dismissive way. He just loves music. When he hears things, he wants to try stuff out. So that wouldn't have surprised me. And I could, probably around that time, he was already thinking he wanted out of the jam and wanted to do his own thing. Yeah. When did they split up? I can't remember. 83, I think. 82, 83. Oh, right. Yeah, around about then. Oh. Um, and I think, yeah, and that's 81, isn't it, that record? It's 81, yeah. I mean, you just, I mean, so, all records should have sounded like that after it came out, because it really does raise yeah. it with, it's just, it's phenomenal. It's amazing, isn't it? And I, I also, I know fashion-wise, I was going through a, a weird, it, so it was post two-tone, and um, so I was about 13. Uh, I just, I just transitioned from, ha you know, having a skinhead and big boots and, you know, Fred Perry's and persuaded my mum to buy me a Crombie because she thought it was a sensible winter coat, but I knew it was, uh, you know, the perfect thing for the rude boy with the red lining that you could pull up and make it look like a hanky. And, and then suddenly we, were list suddenly we were listening to things like Papa's Got a Brand New Pig Bag and going, we started going to a, a night at the Fleet Country Club, me and a few of my mates from school, and that suddenly there was this soul boy crossover and we were listening to just different stuff. And um, I heard a record on the radio the other day that we used to listen to around that time called Welcome to the Monkey House. I don't know if you remember that one. No, I don't, no. Ah, uh, well, it was just it was just a weird time, and then we and you know, Haircut One Hundred came out, and we started it, it, we started wearing that sort of gear, you know, kind of pegged and uh, pointy, sh funny shoes, and having wedge haircuts, and um, you know, white Aaron sweaters, and uh, yeah, we went through a very weird phase that I'd probably rather forget, uh, and thankfully, <laughs> uh, it was just, when it was high time for for the anarcho punk thing to because um, obviously being up in Scotland I always felt that that look the sort of as you said they were pig bag and haircut 100 and also orange juice up in Scotland became yeah. sort of the the kind of indie look the C86 Scottish indie look was kind of was born yeah. from that you know I always felt t -shirt. yeah that kind of that that sort of area but it's, it's, it's a funny bit with pig bag because it is a genuine crossover record you know as you said, there's a two-tone thing going down. But that owes as much into acid house culture almost, you know what I mean? Yeah. The electronic side of it. But I always thought that that soul boy side and also northern soul had a lot to do with what became acid house. Yeah. Certainly a lifestyle, you know. But I think also, and I realise now that there were several eras in my life where I just wanted to, I wanted to dance, you know, and there was there was that, that was a record that you couldn't not dance to. And then, and then there were things that, you know, around that time, you know, Gino by Dixie's Midnight Runners. And um, that was probably a year or two before, wasn't it? But just that, and the, and, the, and anything with a horn section, yeah. you know, like Re Reward by Teardrop Explodes. Explodes. Yeah. So, good, you know, that, that horn section thing is so powerful. And I still, I still love a horn section to this day. Brian, it's like why. when the Bunnymen started to tend to take horn sections a little bit of that era and put them onto stuff, and they're quite far removed from a horn section band, you know. Well, give me. Any, I'm a, I'm a Bunnymen fan. I'm, what, I'm, I'm struggling to think of. Horn. It's on the first LP, isn't it? I, am, I should know which song off the top of my head. Echo the Bunnymen don't like it. Julian Cope fell out with them over it all. I think it's all about a Dave Balfs. Um, song. Ah. Would it be like Reddit in books or something? It's basically, I brought it up because I read it on the toilet about 15 minutes before this, <laughs> this chat. Um, no, but they put, there's a single called Reddit in books okay. and we, and they all recorded it, I think, or they all did their own, I think they wrote it together and then everybody, because they were part of a, what they called the Crucial Three. There was McCulloch and Cope and your man from Mighty Wah, what's his name? Pete Wiley. Pete Wiley. So I think the three of them had a band for a bit, but they clearly three egos like that couldn't stick around together for long. But I think they all recorded a version of Reddit in books. Oh, wow. Okay. I've certainly heard, I've, I've heard two, two of the versions. I've heard the Coke version and, um, or was it Teardrop Explodes version and the Bunnymen version. I mean, a, a phenomenal period of music, that the Liverpool scene oh, at that period. Unbelievable. Incredible. Yeah. Went on to, what, to KLF, you know, what came out of it all, you know, it's just, Frankie goes to Hollywood and 
Pete Barnes and uh, just in if, you, if I could time travel, I would go back to Eric's, you know, in about 79 uh, and just stay there for three or four years. And I think you'd see the best oh. of the best. It'd be amazing. There's a wonderful um, Rock Family Cheese TV series that was out and they have a specific one on that Liverpool scene of the late 70s, early 80s. And it's the best bit of music TV I've ever seen because it's really bitchy, you know, sort of. Yeah. They'd all be sharing offices and nick each other's fan mail and write back, cursing all the fans. And we don't want people. Well, they, were so, they were so ambitious, weren't they? I yeah. mean, they, they really but, all did believe in themselves in a big way. and But really provincial as well. So it was that really small town attitude, but with a big view of the world, you know, just, just yeah. a brilliant mix, especially in music, you know, to have of that two-way street of being small town, being really snipey about the person next door and bitchy, but wanting to take America, you know? Just an yeah. incredible, incredible... But I wonder what all those scousers thought of Cope coming up from Tamworth, you know? <laughs> imagine imagine he'd have got a rough rough ride of it all, you know? Yeah. But too no, no wonder he used to cut himself open on stage. He had to do something to get, to get attention away from the other. <laughs> And um, so you've kept the best to last, have you? Well, I, uh, it's a great record. It's a, and again, this is a record I didn't really know when it came out. But years later, it, it, it's become what I think one of those kind of punk classics that really is, um, you know, it's not as famous as a lot of other punk tunes, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important. I think it's really important. And it's... Um, it's Homicide by 999. Not a band I know well. I know the name of, but I don't know the band very well. I'm afraid to say I don't know a lot of 999 stuff. Right. Well, they, that's the thing. They weren't, they, weren't, uh, they weren't that big, were they? Um, I mean, they were quite niche, even in the punk scene. But over the years, that's a record. If I, you know, my, my sister's in a punk rock covers band, and they, they, always, do, they always do this tune. Uh, many parties I've been to with old punks over the years that will come on at some point. Um, uh, it's just a really good record. Nine 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 homicide. Um, I I think you a should. Great name. They they made a great name for a punk band. It's a great name. A lovely logo. That, that raffle ticket thing. Um, yeah, br- uh, marvelous. Uh, uh, Nineteen seventy eight. That came out, but I probably bought it in nineteen eighty seven. You know, it, it probably took me that long to to work it out. Um, so that and that's a porky prime cut. Let's see if he wrote anything else on it. Um, let's see what he says here. A porky prime cut. That's all he's written on that one. That's probably one of his early works. I mean, when did he start scraping on records? Do we know his history? What do we know well, about this man? I start to, it's actually quite an incredible history. He, um, he basically was a, a um, Liverpool, he was a Merseyside boy, and he got to know the Beatles through selling Paul McCartney a bass. He was a bass player as well. And then when they set up Apple Studios, he went into work there on the back of Noah Macca. He used to mix um, the, no, used to do the, what's it called? It was the, the plate. You know, you would make, create a plate to put vinyl, and he would do that for the Beatles at Apple Studios. And he was famous for being able to get maximum sound on them. He did everything to get them loud. So after doing the Beatles, which obviously you're kind of in a good position from that, he was doing everybody from Led Zepp and all the rest of it, and then moved out to set up his own studios, which is Porky's. And that's when he would write a Porky Prime cut on them all. Not all of them. There's a lot that he did without writing on them. And there's only certain issues that have stuff, so other things would be repressed and go out. But yeah, he's, he's... Done a phenomenal, cut a phenomenal amount of records, you know what I mean? And prided, always prided himself on being loud. And you get a lot of uh, weird ones coming out because you'd assume, you assume it's a bit of a guitar thing, but you'll find Aphex Twin and things like that or all Porky Prime cuts and a lot of dance music. I think he liked that. He could really make it loud, you know? So he kind of, he went into, he loved punk, you know, despite coming from that Mercy Beat background. Love punk because it was loud and he liked to make the records loud and he right. liked a lot of techno because it was loud. So, yeah, funny, funny old history. Is he still with us? He is still with us, yeah. Um, apparently he's got 
a little bit of an illness. Don't think anything bad. I think it's actually more like a bad back or something like that. But he was going to try and come when I did the Porky Prime Cuts night, come to it, but he couldn't arrange a lift to get back home and didn't want to do a taxi stuff and all this sort of behaviour. So he's still with us, still um, a real character as well, you know what I mean? Just a real, almost classic scouser, you know, moustache and, well, you know, that kind of way. But yeah, loves <laughs> these records noisy. Excellent. Well, well done for finding him. And well done for your input. You're a lot better speaking back than I am at asking questions. Sorry for my amateurism. Uh, I believe you've got a record. Um, oh, it's not a Porky Prime cut, sadly, but I have. Um, not yet. After, 20, <laughs> after, <laughs> after 26 years of stand-up comedy, which is how I've been making my living all that time, uh, I've always loved and dabbled with playing a bit of music but I actually started writing comedy songs about three years ago just for my own amusement and they sort of built and built and then eventually my cousin Jamie who I used to be in this punk band with in in the 80s said let's record an album so he had a little studio and a couple of years ago we started going in and just when he had a spare moment we'd record a track here and there and eventually just in time for the lockdown I released my album um uh, which is this called, it's called Moral Vacuum. Uh, it's 12 little, very funny, I like to think funny, comedy songs. Um, you can get hold of this on, um, you can buy it from Music Glue, and I'll uh, sign you a copy and send it to you, or you can listen to it on Spotify and all the usual places. Uh, you can find details about me on uh, Twitter, Benny underscore Norris on Twitter, or I'm on the Facebook. And um, uh, yeah, do, do have a listen. I think it's, it's entertaining. I think you'll enjoy Wonderful. it. Well, from what I know of you, it's bound to be entertaining. Ben, <laughs> thank you very much. A real pleasure. And thank you for helping me out on my first Talking Porkies. Thanks for inviting me, Paul. I enjoyed that. Lovely. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. Bye.